We welcome you to another live edition of the Sports Box, brought to you by our sponsor, Showcase Sports in Hamilton. Showcase Sports for the elite athlete. And by our friends over at Crowdplay. Download the free Crowdplay app today and check them out at www.crowdplayapp.com for details. Ladies and gentlemen, it's showtime. Welcome everybody to the next edition of Cage My IQ. My name is D Bake, your host, and with me today, as always, I got my co-host Miles. How's it going? Doing good, doing good. Doing good. And today, Sam is not with us, of course. Uh, he is working a double, so we're joined by a good friend of mine, Jay, aka MMA uh, uh, Drunky. How are you doing today? Doing good, buddy. How are you? I'm doing good. He hears from uh, the West Coast. He's going to be starting his own uh, podcast soon, so I wanted to get him on. He has a high MMA IQ, and this is a good way for him to uh, to break bread and to just get everybody to know him before he gets started on his own podcast. But uh, tonight we will be uh, previewing UFC Vegas 21, which was near Mohammed versus... Leon Edwards, or I should say lack thereof because of the <laughs> the main event yeah. and how that ended up. But uh, if you want to follow us before we get going with that, I'd just like to tell you to, if you guys could follow us on Twitter at Cage IQ, on Facebook at Cage My IQ SB, and then on Instagram at Cage My IQ. Uh, just follow us, like all of our stuff share it uh, we come out with new episodes every monday which is usually a recap show and then every thursday which usually it pops up on youtube and then i reshare it to the other platforms which is usually the the preview show and then mondays were of course right now are at 8 30 p.m eastern time and then i release the thursday ones at 7 p.m eastern time but now we are on twitch of course and the, the URL is twitch.tv slash cage by IQ. So if you are into the Twitch live stream error, follow us on there. Give us some comments. Show us, show us some love. We're starting to uh, do stuff on that. And then I'm looking to uh, get a live stream going with a bunch of people for UFC 260 where we're just hang out, give our picks, and then give our reactions to each fight. Mm-hmm. Uh, so more people are more than welcome to join us with that but let's get started with uh, the preview at hand we have the first fight we got is a middleweight matchup where we saw eric anders and darren stewart fight to no contest i'll start with you uh jay what, what, what did you think of this well, look, Stewart came out strong. I mean, he came out and he knocked Anders down. I mean, he actually took control in that first half of the fight. And, you know, it, I, man, I, I looked at Eric Anders, and that guy looked like he weighed about 240 pounds. It's like, I, I have no no idea how this guy is even a 205-er. But, you know, even as big as he was, you know, Stewart came out first, and, you know, and he hit Anders and knocked him down. So Anders wanted to uh, – in his game plan decided that, you know, I probably need to take this guy down. Uh, and in doing so, you know, it, it, it was a wild round one. These guys were throwing haymakers at each other. And I expected no one of them to, I expected one of, one of these guys to fall down. Uh, but they did, but Stewart did end up on the ground. And, you know, unfortunately we were uh, presented with a bit of deja vu, if you know what I mean. And that's when, you know, Eric Anders threw the illegal knee. Now, whenever I looked at it in slow-mo, uh, it looked like Stewart put his hand up, uh, but the knee still hit his hand. So I don't know if that's really counted as a knee, but in the moment the ref had to, you know, make his decision on what he saw, and it looked like an illegal knee. And, you know, and, and here, here here we are once again a week later, we – you know, we had, except this one is a no contest because uh, it, it wasn't intentional. So, but while it lasted, that first round was wild. Uh, you know, I expected somebody to go down, but it was an unfortunate ending. What about you, Miles? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it was it was a, initially an exciting fight. <laughs> well, there was uh, some good back and forth happening. Uh, I think at first, Darren Stewart was kind of starting a little hotter than Eric Anders, and then Anders started to kind of gain some steam, and he was wobbling him there at the end. He was he was landing some solid shots um, once he found his rhythm. And as far as the knees concerned, I don't know. That was. It was kind of a, a weird situation he found himself in uh, because one, I think one of one of the things that happened was, yeah, he was blocking his head, but there was also uh, Darren Stewart had three points of contact on the ground, and that's a no-no. If there are three points of contact, you have to wrestle. So that that probably influenced the uh, the, the decision, and of course, you know, <laughs> the fact that he could barely walk forward. They were like, "All right, this guy, let's go ahead and, and end this fight." <laughs> but of course, it was it was funny. We were talking about this last time how sometimes it seems like the refs are maybe trying to pressure the fighters and to be like, "Oh, come on, you can do it," because uh, they're probably receiving some some pushback from uh, you know Dana White for with all these DQs happening. Um, so he had the Chinese doctor coming in and he's all like, all right, can you, can you stand? Are you okay? And then you saw her being, he's like, oh, he's all right. You're okay. Right. You, <laughs> you want to keep fighting, right? <laughs> but then he when did. He, walk, he looked he like, like he wanted to. Right. <laughs> he did. I think he did, but it was, it was clear. Like he was walked over to the doctor and then he just kind of like stumbled back for no reason. They're like, all right, this is not, <laughs> this is not going anywhere good. So I think that's why they probably ended it. But um, yeah, no, it would have been fun to to see this go into a second round. I think Anders probably would have cinched it if it did go to the second round, because even before the knee, Stewart was hurt pretty bad with those shots. Um, the fact that he was, you know, like up against the cage in in like a kneeling position, trying to protect his head, tells you a lot about how that fight was going. So, yeah, yeah just like you guys both touched on in it right there, that the fight started out very hot, like they both were coming at each other, which which I was kind of surprised because Darren Stewart has a pretty good uh, uh, background with his uh, takedown and his grappling, so I guess he just decided to go go at it with the uh, Anders stand up. I was expecting him to start out with the grappling and then work his way to the striking get himself ahead and then get striking but it, he, he came out right away hot and then i was like whoa i was like I didn't, I didn't expect that and then i was i was expecting okay he started like that maybe he's gonna do that and then transition into the grab one but of course it never got that way because of the the new contest uh, it looked like he was starting to uh get to that point and then that happened. Uh, like it, it sucks i i saw a bunch bun, bunch of people on social media giving them shit for uh, stopping it and then uh, mm. saying, oh, what's with all these uh, no contests to the knees? They're just not understanding, just like you said, like the three points, like there's no way you can kind of defend that because mm. it's it's like you're going for a takedown or whatnot and then you just get hit in the head. Like there was no way he was coming in. It wasn't as worse as the Peter Jan Sturden one, which was straight in the middle of the octagon, mm. pretty <laughs> there in front of you to where you can't dispute anything like that was just upfront nonsense this one was okay like maybe like he did not realize the situation like and then he was uh, like apologetic afterwards mm -hmm. and then like i would like to see him go, go back uh, and do this again uh, as soon as they can mm -hmm. which would be the right thing to do because th they were starting to make fireworks in there in the beginning i i, I mm -hmm. I could have saw that all three rounds. I would have been great. Like even with the what happened at the in the main event, I would have been like, yeah, this this is the fight right here to open things up. And then it just didn't work out that way. So it, it sucks for um, it, both of them. Like it sucks for Stewart because he started out strong, and then for it to end that way, and then sucks for Anders because he started to pick things up, and then it, like it was definitely an unintentional uh, knee, but. Uh, yeah, like there's not much else to talk about with that since uh, it only went a round and a half, basically. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll get moving to the to the second fight, which was a flyweight matchup between Matthew Ma Mat Matthias Nikolai Ferrer, who defeated Manel Cape by split decision. Uh, I'll start with you, Miles. Oh, that's right. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> I was, I was looking at the name. I was like, how'd you get that? Because they kept calling him. Um, what was the name they kept calling him? It was like, not Milu, but something else. 
I don't know. I'll go with Mel- Matthias. Melu? Melu? Something like that. I couldn't that name say it. Trips so I, me up. I couldn't say it, so I just <laughs> improvised. <laughs> Matthias. That yeah. actually sounds cooler than what they were saying. But uh, <laughs> so this fight, this fight was probably, you know, one of the most controversial ones of the night. It's, it's really the only one that I remember went the distance. So this was the, the first full fight and the only full fight of the card. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. This was kind of a, a weird decision because here's the thing. You had you had Cape in the first round. And just like the commentators were saying, what he needed was volume. And he wasn't producing it. He was being way too, I wouldn't say timid, but I think he was relying too much on like a counter-striking game. He wanted to lead in Nicolou to come in and, and, you know, mess up on some strikes, create some openings and capitalize. But the problem was, is Nicolou just wasn't doing that. And it's like he kept waiting for it. And at a certain point, you got to go, all right, that strategy is not working. We got to mix things up. We got to try something a little different. Uh, And then when it went into the second round, Cape started to kind of get it together, especially same thing. End end of the first round, last 30 seconds or so, he started to get it together. He was in that mindset going into the second round as well. He was trying to pick up the pace a little bit, do more volume, because that it works when he does it. Uh, but when he doesn't think to do it, that's when when Nicolou just pretty much has his way, you know. <laughs> Especially like first, second round, he got some takedowns in there. He got to, you know, rack up some ground time. Uh he he was he was pretty much fighting Nicolou's fight for Definitely, I would say most of the first round, some of the second round, because then Cape started to kind of get it together, uh, started landing a lot more volume in hits. And uh, in amongst that volume, there was like some pretty heavy shots um, going into the third round. Then he, he kind of figured it out. And that's when, uh, you know, he was not letting Nicolou take him to the ground. He was keeping it on the feet and he was doing really well. Uh, and then it got to the to the split decision. Honestly, by the time it got to the split decision, it was it was hard for me to call because I the way I had it it was uh, I thought Nicolou took the first Cape took the second or maybe that was reversed but it, uh, I had it one to one before the third round and then the third round I was like ah you can make a case for either they both did a, like a decent showing like even Nicolou who's not really much of a striker was trading pretty well but uh, yeah no I guess they gave it to to Nicolou and Cape was pissed <laughs> did you see that <laughs> the fucking face oh he was mad oh. <laughs> big upset but um i don't know the case can be made in the third round for either fighter taking that i could definitely see arguments that cafe did better in the third round and he certainly thought he did better um but i don't know i don't know this is this is like a very this is gonna be a very hotly contested decision and they'll probably need to do another one to put this one to bed um especially if these guys keep climbing through the flyweight ranks um i don't know how well they do in like anybody against the top 10 yet but i think these guys are good enough to maybe start looking at opponents in the top 15 maybe start getting a little rank uh you know build up their careers a little bit get that experience in and they might be you know real threats in the future what about you jay yeah, and I mean, with Manel Cop, I mean, this guy before coming into the UFC, he had a, an amazing resume, to say the least. Uh, prior to coming into the UFC, uh, he he was in the he was in in the Risen organization where um, he beat Tegeo uh, Tegeo Mizugaki and I and Kai Atakura, and he actually became the bantamweight championship uh, the bantamweight champion for uh, you know for Risen. Now, since he's come into the UFC. You know, in his first fight against Alex and Alexander Pantoja, I thought it was maybe nerves. I thought that was maybe one thing, uh, and because I did a lot of research on him and watching his fight against you know Mizugaki and Asakura, and you know he looked phenomenal. So when when this guy came into the UFC, you know I it, you know as a bantamweight, but then he decided you know hey I I can probably drop these other ten pounds. I'm gonna see if I can't go down can't go down to flyweight. So I'm wondering if his decision to move down to flyweight and having to lose that extra 10 pounds is actually affecting him because the guy that I saw fight in Risen that won the bantamweight championship is not the guy that I've seen in the UFC since he's been in there. Now, like I said, that first fight could have been jitters. Now, as we got into the second fight, uh, you know, like Miles said, um, you know, the judges' scorecards were questionable. Yeah. Was it a robbery? Probably not a full on robbery, but I definitely had uh, Nicolau winning that first round. Hands down, no question. And then Manel Cop came out and looked like he was warming up and he was starting to feel good. And he took over in that second round. Now, 
once they got into that third round, Manel Cop kept that kept that momentum going. But as we got towards the end of the fight, that's when Nicola took over. And then you know, it, 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 and, and judges are different. Some of these judges that see these guys, you know, in the last two minutes of a full round, you know, even though the other guy won the first three minutes of the uh, of the third round, they're probably going to give it to the other guy. So I think this was the case with Manel Cop. Uh, you know, my advice for him now that he's on a two fight skid, he's got to he, he's got to figure things out. Uh, I, I think it's maybe the weight cut that is making the difference right now because, I mean, you've seen people drop down from bantamweight, uh, down flyweight, case in point, TJ Dillashaw. And they, it, it just does not work out well for these guys. Now, we're not talking about someone who's dropping from heavyweight to light heavyweight. We're talking about little guys, you know. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, while the while the decision was a bit questionable, you could have gave a case for either fighter. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, like with me, Manel Cape, he's in a position where he needs to show up the whole fight. Like he, he shows up for bits and pieces of it, but the guy that I saw in uh, the tapes in Ryzen is not the guy that I see now. Like he, he's not showing the full the full fledged uh, Manel Cape. He's being passive, tentative. He needs to just go in there and then just go guns blazing. Like he, mm-hmm. his striking is really good. Like it's up, it's up there in the tops in the division. He just doesn't show it. And then you, you can't get behind on the scorecards and then only show part of what you do and then expect to win eight, night in and night out with the mm-hmm. limited amount of fights that you get a year. Uh, like you're getting more now just because fighters are taking less uh, time off. And then going in on less time, like he fought like last month or so, and then he came into here. Like I thought he was going to come in good because hit the third round of the first fight, he, he, was, he was really good. He showed what he could do. Then he comes in and does the same exact thing that he did in the first fight. He, he goes in timid, then shows up last minute or so in the first, last minute or so in the second. But this time he showed a little bit more, but he, he has to show like the whole – 15 minutes. He has to be prepared. He has to put himself ahead instead of coming from behind. He can't rely on the judges to give him the mm-hmm. fight. It, like He has to think in his head, like, okay, I know the judges might not give me this round. I can't go off of what ifs. I got to show them. Boom. I got that round. Boom. I got this round. And, and then if mm-hmm. you're confident, then you can like, like if it's like a five round fight, then okay, I can take the third round off because I got to pace myself. But this is a three-round fight, so he has to come in right mm-hmm. away, all three rounds, and try and win all three rounds. He can't just take time off and then be timid. That's what that, that's what allows these guys who are not strikers and are grapplers to get themselves going, to get their game going, and then maybe get a, a striking game going because they're, they're afforded all this time with what he's given them. Mm-hmm. And I thought that's what was wrong with his game plan. He allowed... He allowed his opponent to uh, get in this, get an early lead, and then sneak out at the, that second round because he wasn't right. shown showcasing what uh, the rounds to the judges. It's it's kind of like the what what have you done for me lately? The last yeah. thing they saw was him not doing well in the third round. That's what they yeah. saw. So at any tough case scenario, they're going to go with the guy that showed showed uh, the best for last. Uh, essentially and that's what happened yeah yeah i think this might be like a mental thing for him because i mean he wasn't competing at as high a level in other leagues and i think that's lost he's lost confidence in his ability to just let go with the hands and you see that a lot with like we saw that a little bit in the in the last uh uh, pay-per-view event that we talked about with uh uh, adesanya and jehovich jehovich being the stronger striker but he was he was kind of afraid to just let go. And then yeah. once he got more comfortable, he started letting go, and it was it was working. Um, I think this is late. kind of that, just on a bigger scale. You know what I mean? Like, he knows, like, oh, shit, these guys are, are like, the best guy I fought in Ryzen is, like, maybe middle of the pack here in UFC just because they picked the best possible fighters to come in here. Um, and I think he's maybe 
not as confident just going, all right, I can uh, do what I did back then and it'll work just as well. Now I think he's in his own head thinking, Oh man, if I throw this punch and it doesn't go well, I could create an opening and the other guy will come in and hit me. And I think he's starting to try to rely on a counter attack game. When in reality, um, most of the time the guy you're fighting is just as nervous as you are. So <laughs> it's usually better to just take the initiative, but um, we'll see if he can yeah, figure yeah, that yeah, out yeah. in the long run. And he's got some decisions to make as well, uh, you know, as far as, you know, it, you know, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, it took you, you know, three or four losses before the UFC decided that they were going to cut you. So right. now we're in a day and age where you lose two. Yeah. You got some decisions <laughs> to make. So I don't like, yeah. like I, yeah, like I said, I don't know. I, I think it's the wick cut. I really do. You know, from seeing him fight and risen mm -hmm. and looking at him now and seeing that he's tentative, I think he's, I, I just think his body is is reacting different and it's not used to losing those mm -hmm. 10 pounds. So he's got some decisions to make as far as, mm -hmm. you know, we're, if he's going to go back to bantamweight or stay at flyweight. Uh, right. I think he should go back to bantamweight. Yeah. I, mean, I could see a case for him having being affected by weight cuts, but that's the thing. Typically, weight cuts going down uh, tend to work in your favor. And the reason why is because if you do a lot of strength training, strength training doesn't increase your weight that much because your gains are only relative to the amount of strength you possess. Uh, so you can get really, really strong, but your weight will right. only go up marginally relative to the amount right. of strength you've gained. So you do that, couple that with some good diet, some, you know, cutting out the, the excess shit in your, in your, diet that's adding uh, more fat reserves and you can even just go on like a big I'm going to burn all my fat reserves binge before you weigh in that sort of thing cut all the water weight right. stuff um, and then once you kind of equalize out before the fight you're the bigger stronger guy just because you come from like a bigger build normally at what you would fight at but now sure. you're getting to fight people who normally are not as heavy or uh, you know as as strong as you are naturally so usually those those weight cuts down tend to work really well like uh, Shevenko I think that worked for her really well uh, going down to uh, the weight class she's in, and now she like dominates that weight class. Right. So I think it would be more like we'd have to look at how he went about doing that weight cut. I think that would be the key sure. factor here, because if he did it wrong, sure. But I don't know. I feel like it's more of a mental thing at this point, because I think he has a coach who knows what he's doing, right? I don't think the coach yeah. is like, all right, we're going to just lock you in a room and starve you until you're 10 pounds lighter and then just send you out there. I, I believe in you, you know? but I feel like this is a performance thing from in here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the only thing that I tightly disagree with, with the Yehovich Asana thing which I do agree with the what you're saying with it is Yehovich Yeho was being tentative, but at the same time, he was creating problems with the leg uh, with the leg checks with the mm -hmm. Adesana, and Adesana was getting flustered and it was getting him out of his game. Whereas in this one, Cape wasn't really getting uh, 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 Nikolai out of his game. It, he was, was, he was the problem. Yeah, yeah that, that was the problem with this. <laughs> yeah. Like Yehovich was able to skate by just with. Uh, stopping the leg kicks because mm -hmm. uh, like at, and then he was able to get to the third fourth round when he was like okay maybe I should start getting my wrestling going get get him down because I have that thirty pound advantage mm -hmm. I do yeah. feel like moving down it, it is good for like like if you're a grappler or whatnot because uh moving, you have that more uh, room you're not heavier but then moving up usually a striker does better when he moves up. But in this case, he's he moved down. Like he, he doesn't really have that grappling game. He relies on the striking. So I thought he should have stayed at bantamweight. I thought that would have been a better, mm. better move. Maybe it, it's affected him with the weight cut. Maybe it's not. But he has to be more assertive and more, and put more effort into uh, starting out early and then going by his right. pace. If he could go yeah. by his pace and get started early, he'll be in good shape. But right. he hasn't that, been able to it, do that. And the cop that I saw in Risen actually was not tentative in the first round, and he took yeah. chances. And that, I mean, you, yeah, especially in the flyweight division, that, that's probably the worst division to be tentative in. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I think it's cost him. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, especially his his size and relative weight to everybody else big. normally. 
He is, and I think he would actually be a more powerful striker in that weight division. I think he'd end up being like one of the the heavier hitters. Um, but I think the bigger concern there would be, well, how would he perform against someone who can actually grapple? Because in the flyweight division on the ground, man, they're spry. They're spry as hell. And I don't think with any, yeah. you know, no real grappling background, that would be the big danger. Um, but again, yeah, I think it's just a confidence thing at this point. He just needs to trust himself and, and just let those yeah. hands go. So we got exactly. we got Chozu95 commenting in. Hey guys, Yo, how's so. it going? Thanks for tuning in. I know who that is. That's uh that's Ann. <laughs> hey, okay. Ann. <laughs> uh, thanks uh, yeah like i said thanks for tuning in but yeah like he definitely he definitely needs to be more assertive like like, like I, I look at it this way the first round is the most important round in, in, in a three round fight to get because you want to get that one round uh, under your belt right away and get that one round in your favor then you had two rounds to get just one whereas if you lose the first round you got to get the next two Right. Without a doubt, like in the first round gives you a little bit of leeway in that second round, maybe third round. If you get the second round just completely, then then you're guaranteed it. But like with judges and nowadays and the questionable decisions that they make that I've seen of the last year or two, you got to get that first round. And he right. didn't get that. So that's that, that was a big thing with that. Yeah, I think there's a case to be made to have more judges. I think that's one of the issues that we're coming up against with well, these they work decisions. In a, they work in a boxing style judging uh, scorecard, mm -hmm. and they've adjusted it as the years have gone on. Yeah. But I mean, to, even then, boxing has like, don't they have like five judges, I think, for a given boxing match? Like, they have more than three, because three, I, there's there's a lot of room for error for just three. Yeah. But I mean, if yeah. you had at least five, then you I could have like, like some more diversity of opinion and more viewpoints on that. I, just imagine like five years ago, the judging uh, scorecard benefited the grapplers, the wrestlers. You saw right. guys that would just <laughs> take a guy down. It, it, you, you could get hit 20 times. Mm -hmm. Take and then your opponent could take you down, and the, he, he, because he took you down, they'd give him the the round because they yeah. they gave that so much momentum on that takedown that mm -hmm. it overpowered everything else. And I give it to them for for at least fixing the score the scoring to where they dumbed it down so it's like an even playing field because right. like guys would just do that they just fall uh, they take you down and lay on you for five <laughs> for five minutes, <laughs> aka John Finch, but. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but moving on to the third fight, uh, third fight, which was actually a, a good fight in itself, we had a matchup oh, yeah. between uh, a bantamweight matchup between Davy Grant and Jonathan Martinez, which saw Davy Grant win by second round knockout. I'll start with you, Miles. Yeah, this one was pretty dope, actually. I really enjoyed this fight. Um, now I know David Grant is supposed to be, uh, or he got his start in the UFC, we should say, uh, with his grappling resume. So, I mean, he can grapple, the dude can grapple, but recently he's been coming out more with the hands. He's been showing he can stand and trade when he needs to. And this was a really good, uh, a really good example of that because I think, wasn't Martinez the favorite in this fight? If I'm not mistaken, oh, yeah. he, he was the biggest fan really? on the card. Yep. Yeah. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. So, he I mean, was, uh, I, minus I think yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I think they thought that, you know, Martinez being, you know, uh, presumably the better striker, that he was just going to have his way with Davy Grant, who's the grappler trying to learn striking as he goes along, which is usually the narrative. But I think, uh, you know, I don't know if it's the coaching, you know, it's probably a combination of the coaching, natural athleticism, and just his ability to kind of pick up on the strategy of striking. Because strategy is like one part technique, one part like, do you have natural strength? Because that transitions a lot into power. And then one part understanding how to place those strikes strategically to open someone's guard, create openings, and of course, you know, add up to a knockout. Um, and yeah, I think David Grant just kind of took to it really well. And this this was a great show in form, especially against someone like Martinez, um, who was kind of a slow starter. You know, in, in the in the first round, he was definitely more reserved, uh, which kind of for his style, I kind of understand that. Um, Muay Thai, eh, sometimes they come out guns blazing. Sometimes they're a little bit more strategic about how they want to fight because if you get in too close, you're going to eat elbows and knees and stuff. And, uh, you know, if you're fighting in Thailand, the, the gloves aren't great, so they hurt pretty bad. <laughs> so so you tend to be a little bit more reserved as a fighter, uh, you know, approaching someone who you've never fought before. So 
as they were going through though, Martinez was picking up steam. He had some, some really nasty leg kicks and you saw, you saw uh, Grant's foot there at the end. It was turning black. Like, Holy yeah. crap. Yeah. <laughs> Whoo. Not fun. Not fun at all. But, uh, I mean, he just kept going. He just kept plowing right straight ahead. Didn't really rely on any of that grappling stuff. And, uh, I mean, yeah, just there at the end and in, in what was it, the second round, he got that combo uh, where he went kind of low to the body and then came up top. And, you know, they, it was funny because they, uh, they both got clipped, but Martinez got the worst end of that exchange. And it ended up, you know, knocking him down. And that was the end of the fight. So, I mean, this is this was a really good showing for Grant. Uh, I think Martinez is hopefully going to take this as a learning experience and go, okay, all right. That guy, you know, he was definitely, I would say, the more aggressive of the two in terms of, like, he was trying to put out the volume. He wasn't really worried about, like, oh, what if the guy counterattacks or something? You know what I mean? So I think this was a lesson for Martinez in, like, eh, sometimes you just got to go for it. Sometimes you just got to take the initiative and be the one to, you know, put it out there. And then hopefully you can react to whatever's going to happen and not get knocked the hell out. Uh, because if this 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 happened the other way, he was too timid. He was too receiving, and by the time he had built up enough steam to really, you know, get in there and start trading, you know, that, that's all she wrote. <laughs> he took that one shot, that one crazy punch, put him out, and uh, so hopefully we'll see some adjustments in his game plan there. But uh, no, again, great show for Davy Grant. Not sure where I want to see him next. Uh, I don't even know what he's ranked, but he's definitely. I think he's earned a shot somewhere in the top. I would say between the top nine and top 12, somewhere in that region, I feel like would be a good matchup for him. Okay. Yeah, we, so got some, yeah, we got some comments before I go right to you, uh, Jay. We got chosen saying, yeah, he was, I picked him to win and nope. Grant ruined that for me. <laughs> LOL. Yikes. Yeah. He KO'd him. Big surprise to me. We yep. got Alex saying, what's what up, up y'all? What's up, Alex? Then you got him doing the Back hand your signals. Gang signs at us. Yeah. <laughs> gang signs. We got Brian. Oh, Brian. In, doing great. Thanks, Brian. Guys. He's part of our MMA community. What's going on? Thanks for uh, coming on and uh, coming. I am just hanging with the boys talking oh, no. MMA. And now we got some smiley faces to <laughs> go with the gang sign. So can't <laughs> can't beat that. Yeah. But uh, let me uh, get you your opinions on this, uh, Jay. Yeah, so like it's a, we had, had ourselves another great flyweight matchup. Now, if you were looking at the two guys and if you were looking at everything that people were saying prior to the week, nobody gave Davy Grant a chance. Nobody, nobody had Davy Grant win, and that's the reason he was the biggest underdog on the card. Let me tell you a little something about Jonathan Martinez. Uh, aside from his robbery to Andre Yule, which I believe was the biggest robbery of 2020, uh, he would be on a five-fight winning streak coming into facing David Grant because uh, he beat Thomas Almeida, he beat he beat Frankie Sainz, and then he had that robbery, <laughs> and then he had two more wins prior to that. So technically, technically, I would say you know Jonathan Jonathan Martinez came in on a five-fight winning streak. And I mean, he's looked he's looked impressive in every single one of his fights. Now, when he came out into this fight, you wouldn't have thought differently because those leg kicks were I mean, I don't know if he knocked him down once or twice with those leg kicks, but those leg kicks were absolutely brutal. One thing I saw about with Johnny Jonathan Martinez in that first round is and especially with these flyweights is head movement. You got to have that head movement because these are the fastest guys in the UFC. So once we got into that second round, I started to see Jonathan Martinez not move as much. And that's when uh, Davey Grant caught him. And I mean, that's all it takes is one uppercut to the chin. And, you know, it, it, it'll sit anybody down. So I got to give big props to Davey Grant for like uh, like Miles said, if you saw his foot, his foot was basically turning black. So yeah, he was fighting with a broken foot. Uh, he had to overcome. He had to overcome that first round, which was absolutely brutal. I mean, there, uh, man, I, props to Davy Grant for, for for pulling through on that. That's a big win for him. And you you may not know it, but he's actually on a three fight win streak right now. So um, yeah, he definitely deserves somebody. Uh, probably in the top 15, maybe someone in the top 10. Uh, it, it, it's the flyweights, but he 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 deserves a big matchup coming up. Yeah, I'm looking at the rankings right now uh, overall, and uh, the, because it was a bantamweight matchup, and they're actually back to back in rankings. They have David Grant 
32, and then they have uh, Martinez 33. But that's an all of MMA in being mm. weight wise. And I'm looking at the potentially who he could fight next. And right now, the the name that pops up is Trevin Jones, who just won, I believe it was last week uh, or the week before uh, on the, on the UFC 259 card, where they they had him as like a, a massive underdog, and he came out and knocked out the the favorite, which I bet. Of course, I'm one of the unlucky people to to pick against Trevin Jones, and then he goes out and with that crazy. <laughs> Uh, like knockout where he like spun his hand around mm-hmm. and knocked him out. That was the very first fight on the card last week, and yeah, he surprised everybody uh, because he was very low ranked, uh, uh like betting wise. But and then I could see that because he's ranked twenty six, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and then he's the next name on the list. So I could see that as a matchup for Grant. Uh, that would be a decent matchup. Uh, between them, it's another matchup of striking against grappling because uh, Jones is more of a striker. But uh, David Grant, like, he came out, like, I thought he was done in the first round. I thought he was going to be done after mm-hmm. those leg kicks, but the, he survived. Name of the game, you, you just got to survive and then catch a break uh, to uh, come back from it. And that's what he did. Like, it was crazy. He was like, he ducked and then he went like this and caught him. <laughs> with the shot and then just Hello finished him. It, it, <laughs> exactly. That, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking of Street Fighter. Uh, I was thinking of that exactly, uh, but I didn't want to say it. Yeah, but that's how he won. And Copyright. Then, you, yeah. You, you, you can catch, if you can catch a, a fighter, make one mistake. That's all it takes is one mistake to lose a fight. And that's what happened. Martinez made one mistake and David Grant make, made a great uh, move to duck mm-hmm. and uh, hit him, caught him good, won the fight. Even after that disastrous first round, man, he got the victory. So Martinez has all the tools to be a champion. Oh, I yeah. mean, w- without a doubt. I mean, we've seen, but you, it, it's just those little mistakes. You know, it, all mm-hmm. it takes is that one little mistake. In the UFC, you can't have those little mistakes. You, I, I know they say no one's perfect, but, you know, in fighting, you got to be perfect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or at the very least, you have to know where your weaknesses are. Like, there's, I would say, like, Gaethje's a great example. Gaethje, he's a power striker, but the only reason he's a power striker is he puts everything behind every punch. He, like, way over swings. But then he knows, like, hey, I got good movement. I can get the fuck out of the way when I need to. So he'll, like, do these big over swinging hits. And then when normally other fighters would be like, oh, all right, crap, I'm about to get hit. He, you know, uses movement to get out of the way. So you have to kind of, it's a balancing act between knowing where your weaknesses are, where your strengths are, and then how to kind of cover the gaps in between. And that's what makes, you know, a well-rounded fighter in the UFC. That's why you have someone like Adesanya who like, has no grappling ability really at all. He's a blue belt, I think, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, he was like working on wrestling against the cage for the Yehovich fight, and, and that's like it. Like <laughs> that's pretty much all his grappling. But the dude's twenty and zero because his hands are so good. He can cover the gaps in his, you know, grappling to make sure like it doesn't get too bad for him. So, he's, he's he's deceptive too, where yeah. he can make you go a certain way. And then hit you with that, like mm-hmm. between that and the, just like you said, is uh, his combinations are lethal. Uh, like he, he, m- for most guys, he doesn't need a, a grappling game at all because he's just going to do what he wants. He's just going to stand up or, away from that. You know that way. Yeah. That's never really a concern. I think I've only seen him go to the ground like four times, maybe. That's, that's why those uh, Yoel Romero, fight, and then what was the other fight where where he looked just so. It was so boring because he kept the fight in his warehouse yeah. standing, and yeah. then he would just p- go in, pick and choose whenever he wanted to, because he didn't want to go to the ground because of the right. massive a- advantage his opponents had. Your your own Romero's not going to kill you on the ground, but if he gets you ass on on the ground with that weight difference, he's gonna mm. he's gonna get him, and that's what happened with Yehovich. He was able to just lay down, move over, whenever he wants. And then yeah. some of these guys have to start training against that now. Now, now you're probably going to see an even stronger Adesana because he's like, okay, now I'm going to have to get that 
that grappling game going, that, mm-hmm. that de- defense uh, under my belt because I know moving up, all these guys going to have it. Because, uh, but at least in his favor, he was like, "It's it's the late heavyweight champion." At least me losing was to the to the champion above me, and then it, it took him to uh, doing that to really solidify the win the last couple mm-hmm. rounds. Because right. if he wouldn't have, wouldn't have, you could have saw Adesanya come back, but. Yeah, definitely so. But uh, moving on uh, to the fourth fight on the card, which was 22 seconds, no lie, <laughs> was Dan Ige uh, picking up a 22-second knockout in the featherweight division uh, where he knocked out Gavin Tucker with one punch. The, the fight lasted long. Uh, the, the, the fight lasted yeah. shorter than me talking about the, the beginning of the fight. Yep. So I'll start with you, Jay. This shouldn't take long. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they, it, it shouldn't take long. Well, I mean, Gavin Tucker is no slouch. I mean, the guy did – He, I mean, he was 13-1 and one coming into this fight. He, he was on a three-fight win streak. And <laughs> – sorry, I saw Alex's <laughs> comment pop up right there. Thank you, Alex. Um, but, yeah, Gavin Tucker came in on a three-fight win streak, and – you know, Danny Gay, his last fight was against Calvin Cater, and, you know, Calvin Cater won that fight. But prior to that, he was on a six-fight win streak. So we expected fireworks coming in here, you know, when the, when the, whenever this fight started. And, oh, you got it. You yep. know, <laughs> we expect – I mean, because, listen, I wanted to see Ryan Hall versus Danny Gay. Ryan Hall is one of my favorite fighters to watch, and when he fell out, I, I actually was bummed about this entire card. You know, that's how sad I was. But when I heard they were bringing in Gavin Tucker, I was like, okay, so this th- this will be a good matchup for Danny Gay to, you know, bounce back from beating Calvin Cater. And if he can get this, I mean, it'd be a substantial win to keep him to where he can fight someone in the top 10. But, you know, head movement, head movement, head movement. Gavin Tucker came, came out, I mean, and it didn't look like he was really even moving that much. And he lunged forward and got too aggressive and Danny Gay just run right down the pipe, and it was a one-hitter quitter. I mean, it was a beautiful punch, easy night out for him. You know, it was a fantastic performance by Danny Gay. You can't ask for anything better than 22 seconds. Um, yeah, before I get to you, uh, uh, to you, Miles, I've got a comment. Oh, my God, that was a great KO. I loved it. It was an overhand right, that it wasn't was. it? Yep. That it was. <laughs> and then uh, go right, now lean right to Miles. Uh, what did there you think? You go. I mean, the dude just got knocked out. <laughs> That's just straight <laughs> up what happened. Like, it was funny. I, I started roping my mom into watching the fights with me. So, like, whenever yeah. it's a whenever it's a minor card, I've got like a UFC fight pass and ESPN Plus. We'll just find it between one of those. Uh, so, so you know, <laughs> I go over and we put it on the TV and stuff. And when this fight is gonna start, like I don't really research the the minor fights, like the the um, fight night cards. I usually do all my research for the pay per view fights because those are like the big ones that I have to like do predictions for. And my research typically takes like four hours just for a five fucking card fight. So I like to just kind of watch these minor cards. And it was funny. We were sitting on the couch. She's like, so he got in this fight. And then as soon as she said that, the knockout happened. I was like, I got that guy. Yeah, that guy looks good. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, there you go. But th- so this is kind of the, the thing. You have to balance between taking initiative and being aggressive, but also like, you know, doing it in a smart way. And this, I think that was a great example of how not to do it. Like, I think <laughs> that if this fight had gone on, we would have yeah, <laughs> needed no <laughs> True. Exactly. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, I think if this fight hadn't ended that way, we might have seen a, a, a somewhat interesting fight because between the two of them, it's hard to discern, uh, especially with how short the fight was, who's got the power advantage, right? So, I mean, they're both pretty heavy strikers for the division. Uh, they both look, you know, pretty freaking massive dudes, especially for being like featherweights. Um, so I think it would have been interesting to see these guys kind of fight it out. But like, like you said, he just kind of lunged in there and it was, it was kind of like we were talking about the, uh, the Lewis and Curtis blades fight. Like just because you can do a thing, you still have to like kind of couch it a little bit. Like the, the problem with Curtis blades is he kept just trying to run in for a takedown and it's like, bro, that's not how you do takedowns. You got to set it up, right? You got to throw some punches. Make yeah, and, if it, and, it, 
and then shoot. You know, <laughs> this was the same issue here. He's like, oh, I really want to hit him. I want to hit him so bad. And then he just lunged in there and he didn't really think about, all right, there's going to be an opening. So, you know, maybe I throw some feints, maybe I throw a low and then come high, you know, maybe I work my comedy, something, anything <laughs> rather than just a lunging in cross. Cause it looks like they, that's what he was going for. Or maybe a hook. I can't, I couldn't tell, but then, Ige was just faster and he got in there and that was it. That's all she wrote. So. My my friend to, uh, told me that in these t- type of situations, this is what you call a, a crisis of confidence because it looked like he really wanted to go in for the, uh, for the takedown. And then he throws that punch and then that's what cost him because it was mm-hmm. a, literally like a half a second difference between him c- c- connecting on a punch to Ige and then Ige connecting the knockout to him. Right, yeah. It was literally like, boom. Ige was and then just it, like if, if, yeah. if, if you if he would have, I, I felt like if he would have not went for that faint like takedown and then punch, he would have connected and not mm-hmm. knocked out Ige. I felt like I I'm fully confident that's what would have happened because Ige wasn't blocking. He had a wide open face, but that split second between the sign he was going to go for a takedown and then pull back and punch was the difference between him knocking out Ige and then him getting knocked out. Right. Like like he should have been confident with the strike and not be like, oh, I want to go strike and then go to lunge in for the takedown and then throw the punch because he, he didn't want to go for the takedown. Like mm-hmm. just have confidence in your stand-up game. And like you would have had that win, uh, most likely had you have had the confidence. I think moving on, like he needs to work on if if he's not confident, he has to build that confidence somehow. Mm. Whether it's training, whether it's just be like trust in his uh in his uh, corner, be like just right. throw it, just throw it. Don't hesitate because right. when you hesitate, that's when you make make mistakes or get knocked out because right. th- th- that's what happens in this sport. You make that yeah. one split second mistake, and then it'll cost you a fight or or so. And then from there on, you could go on like a downward spiral very quickly because you lose confidence. And co- confidence is key in this sport. You got to have yeah. confidence to win. I think it's not just yeah. confidence. Confidence is, allows you to get started. Yeah. Confidence allows you to like, all right, I can let my hands go. Okay, I can, when I see an opening for a shoot, I can take it because I feel like I can get it, right? But then the other part of that is the strategy. And I think yeah. that's really what was lacking here because they were both confident. Ige was just faster and and <laughs> Tucker didn't have any strategy going into this. Like, I, I, It was unclear what he was trying to do. It was clearly like, I, it looked like a hook to me. You could have made a case for a cross, whatever it was. I yeah. think it was supposed to be the start of a combination or maybe a flurry of the hands to create an opening for, you know, like a leg kick or a takedown, something. But the problem is there was like not a lot of forethought there. And it just happened to be that Ige was faster. Um, now, the only way that would have paid off is, of course, if Tucker was faster, but that's kind of a, I don't know if you want to put your money on that, like who's going to be faster in any given yeah. second, because a lot of a lot of fights do come down to just who's that, that half second, who's able to get it in before the other guy, and the way you counter that is strategy, is it's how you I understand just, yeah. how they work. I just felt like Ige was like, I'm going in for the strike, and there's mm-hmm. n- no nothing, no ifs, ands, or buts, and then Tucker was like, uh, I'm gonna go for a take that. Oh no, you know what? Punch. And then, then that's what he did. That last split second, just like you said, the strategy wise, got go with one thing. Don't hesitate and go to another thing just because you don't feel like doing it anymore. Like Ige was like going in for the strike right away. Boom. It, 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 whatever happens happens, and then it benefited right. him because he didn't hesitate. And that's I would be remiss. I would be remiss if I if I didn't say that this night was not a great night of knockouts. To I mean I mean the twenty two second knockout was impressive, but it wasn't the best knockout of the night. So I mean I can't. I know we're talking about the main card, but that wasn't even the fastest knockout on the card. The first fight of the night, Schumelsberger knocked out Witt in sixteen seconds. That was the most impressive knockout of the night. Yeah, uh, that was bad. That was bad. That too. was. I mean, I know a lot of people were were glad that Wick got it, but I I I just would would have been remiss if I didn't say anything about that knockout. Hey, that guy that guy was shaking when he was trying to get up. That's how mm-hmm. bad it was. Yeah. <laughs> and then there and then it was funny because when you look at, on the the their po- picture bio on the thing, he has yeah. long hair in that, but then he cut his hair right before this fight, and I'm like, damn, 
if that's what happens uh, when you cut your hair, maybe you should cut, cut your hair more often. Right. Yeah. Cut, come right in 16 seconds. Boom, knockout. Boom. Like, And then it gets that 50,000 because he was one of the four guys to get a performance of the night. They Instead of going yeah. like knockout or fight of the night or whatnot, they just went four performance of the night. Yeah, four performance mm-hmm. of the night. Uh, I don't know, which was smart with everything that went yeah. on with this. But yeah. uh, great performance by uh, Ige. I'm trying to look at who he could fight next in that uh, in that division right there. Ryan Hall. Ryan Hall. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> people are still clamoring for that fight. I mean, yeah. I would love to see that fight. I, I hope yeah. they're – I mean, because, you know, Ige didn't take too much damage. Uh, I don't see any reason. Yeah, but I, I think damage. he wants to <laughs> – yeah, I've had zero uh, damage. <laughs> <laughs> well, he he is ranked number nine, yeah. and then I, I can only imagine he would only go up from there. Ryan Hall's not even in the top fifteen. Right. That's the that's the problem with that one. He was just taking that fight because he had no one to fight. And I guess mm-hmm. he the, the, the hype on Ryan no Hall. <laughs> And no one else will take a fight against Ryan Hall. But you got you got Jeremy Stevens ahead of him. I, I'm surprised he's still in the UFC with the losing streak he was on. You, you have Josh Emmett, who ha, who's probably still injured. He's been out since uh, that injury against – it was Burgos, right, Shane Burgos? Yeah, that was he, a great he, fight. Yeah, great fight. And then he had the unfortunate uh, tear, I think, of his uh, ACL or something like that. Oh, uh, man. Uh, I believe that's what it was. Then you got Calvin Cater. Then you got Calvin Cater, who he lost to. I don't think they would go right into a rematch right away. But then you got an intriguing one you would have if you haven't fight somebody above would be the Korean Zombie, who's ranked number five. Well, that's well, that's who he was calling out. I think that's the best matchup. You know, take my money. (laughs) Oh yeah, because when I look at it, I look at like. Rodriguez and Zabib were supposed to fight each other twice, and then that got pushed back. I, I yeah. see them fighting each other. You got Ortega fighting Volkanovski, and then Max Holloway is kind of like floating around after uh, dominating Calvin Cater. Mm-hmm. So I could see a, a situation where they have Korean Zombie facing Dan Ige, then maybe the, the winner of that uh, like faces Max Holloway, because I feel like after the Volkanovski Ortega fight, if Volkanovski wins handily, I think he'll take time off uh, after having all those wins. And then the only way I see him fighting sooner is if, say, Ortega upsets him and wins. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then uh, pick that up, which is kind of funny talking about Ortega because I was watching uh, the movie The Tax Collector. I'm watching it in there. I'm like, is that Brian Ortega? Was and he, in the movie? he was in that movie. Which movie? Oh, that's the, uh, the one with Shia Tax- LaBeouf. Yes, where he plays Creeper. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian Ortega is in the mm. movie for a good like 20, 10, 15 minutes. Wow. And uh, he's in a good 10, 15 minutes. And then even Brandon Schaub's in the movie. <laughs> huh. Nobody yeah, cares. But I'm not up to date on movies. I lost <laughs> yeah. track of all the movies recently. <laughs> I didn't even realize. I didn't huh. really. Yeah. I'm watching now. I'm like, this guy looks like uh, Ortega. So I go look in the. The cast and thing, and it shows him Brian right. Ortega uh, wow. is in it. And I'm like, oh shit! I'm like, okay. right before he cut his hair. So I'll ask, <laughs> is it good? Because I haven't seen it yet. It's 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 pretty good. And I I, I feel like uh, I feel like there's a few things that I really didn't get, but for the overall, I, I gave it like a seven out of ten. It was pretty good. Mm-hmm. But uh. I got damn. I got like ten comments on here right now. So let uh, me they've been adding up. <laughs> uh, he said, "I thought it was uh, faster than twenty-two seconds. It right. was twenty-two seconds. The first fight was sixteen. Right. Ryan Hall never fights. There's nobody. The KO happened so fast. I thought it was faster than twenty-two seconds. He says, "Ever same. I thought it was fifteen seconds. Oh, gee. Stevens. Uh, Stevens never a born fight. That's why he's on card." Oh, on roster. Yeah, he he, oh, okay. he just needs to pick up wins. He had like four or five losses in a row. I'm like, mm, in the new yeah. new day UFC, how does he live? Like, how does yeah. he stay with all those losses? See, Zombie versus Lander they... Garcia, mm. one of the best bras. Oh, yeah. I mean, Drunky, yeah. that that the new crack vape stick. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> 
Does he play? Does he play a chick? No. No. <laughs> That'd be a very manly chick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now Ryan Hall is such a very interesting fighter. No one wants to fight him. His style is different. Definitely agree with that. Someone mm-hmm. wants to fight him. Doesn't need wins because he's exciting. <laughs> but uh, Ryan Hall. Yep. But to go <laughs> and transition from that twenty-two second fight to another knockout which at least lasted a couple minutes in itself, was the Kobe event, which was a late heavyweight matchup where we saw Ryan Spann defeated Misha Kirkinoff by first-round knockout. I'll start with you, Jay. Well, listen, I, mean, I know Leon Edwards in the main event. He, you know, he hasn't had a fight since 2019. Well, a lot of people don't realize that Misha Kirkinoff uh, – you know, he hasn't had a fight since 2019, too. So I was interested. I was highly interested to see, you know, what he would look like coming back. If we would actually see a different Misha Sukhanov, you know, he he looked like he lost muscle. So it kind of told me, uh, you know, when, when they were announcing the names and I'm just looking at him, I'm like, you know, he doesn't look the same. When I think I lose muscle, I, I think two things. He's off steroids. Or he just, you know, he's not working as hard anymore. Now, I expected Misha Serkinov. Misha Serkinov hasn't had a fight since 2019, but he he did get a win in 2019 in his last fight. Do you know who that was against? Jimmy Crute. Jimmy Crute is on a tear right now in the light heavyweight division. So Misha Serkinov has the tools to beat. Uh, you know, he he can beat any light heavyweight, I believe. But in his case, I think that ring rust was a was a big factor. He just he totally didn't look like the same Misha Serkinov that you know put uh, you know Jimmy Crute in a in a chokehold and choked him out. You know, it, but Ryan Spann, you know, I haven't been very high on Ryan Spann, uh, and I don't know why. He's an enormous lightweight. I mean, he's uh, he he's tall. He's got length. He's fast. He has good good precision. And we saw that clearly tonight. I mean, this was another instance where you know Misha didn't take his head off the center line because the punch that Ryan Spam put on Misha Serkinov, you don't get any straighter than that. I mean. <laughs> It was beautiful. I, I know that wasn't the one that knocked him out, but once he went to the ground, I think Ryan Spann was very smart to have Misha Serkinov stand back up. And once Misha Serkinov stood back up, he took a shot to the temple, and Mark Smith had seen enough. You know, I, w- it, I was surprised by Ryan Spann, you know, because I thought Misha Serkinov was going to have complete control of this fight, and I'll be the first one to, I'll be the first one to admit I was wrong. And congratulations to Ryan Spann because, you know, that's a big win for him. I think his biggest win prior to this was over uh, Noguera, light heavyweight no- Rogerio Noguera, the little brother. Yeah. Uh, but he he didn't have that notable win that he needed on his resume uh, until tonight. And that was a huge win. And, you know, it was he, – he impressed me a lot, a lot more than I expected him to. So my apologies to Ryan Spann. You have my faith now. What about you, Miles? Yeah, no, this was a this was a pretty good fight. I enjoyed watching it. Um, I know Serkinov was like the heavy favorite, and just like I did some googling while you know they were getting ready to start everything, so I was like, oh, okay. So this is an instance of like a guy who's been out for a while, and you know he's kind of coming back in. Uh, but before, you know, he he showed a lot of promise. Um, and, and this is the thing, this, this will probably come up in the next fight as well, where, uh, Edwards was talking about, like, he doesn't believe in ring rust, uh, to a degree. I agree with him. Ring rust. Isn't like, it's not a proximity to the ring thing. It's a, are you, are you maintaining a steady work ethic? That's really more what it boils down to. And I think that's probably what got him is that, you know, since he hadn't been fighting in a while, because when you have, when you know you have a fight coming up, you're putting a decent amount of time of your week to go into the gym, make sure you're training, listen to your trainer, you know, do all the things you need to do to be successful. And then when you don't have a fight, there's a big temptation to just go, oh, good. Now, you know, instead of going in like four days a week, I can go in like twice. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I think that's probably what kind of that that set him up for failure here. So 
Yeah. I think uh, there was too much time taken off because I think what probably happened and he, you know, since he hasn't been fighting for a while, there was a decent chunk of that time where he was like, eh, just kind of phoning it in, showing up twice a week, not super, you know, tough workouts, not really, you know, testing himself or, or pushing him forward and getting better, just, you Absolutely. know, lightly maintaining. And then when they gave him this fight, he's like, all right, now it's time to work. But in reality, I mean, if you're a professional fighter, he's number 11, was number 11. Uh, when you're like that close to the top 10, you generally want to be like always ready, especially the way they're doing fights now where you could get a fight with three weeks notice and you just got to you got to go. So there's there's this idea that the fighters who are most successful tend to be the ones who maintain this steady work ethic throughout the year, regardless if they have a fight coming up or not. And I think he just didn't. Um, and I mean, he came in, he, you know, held his own for a little bit. Uh, and then Span, who had been fighting more often, more regularly, maintained that work ethic throughout the year because he was always preparing for a fight. Uh, and it just showed because, I mean, like, on paper, these two guys, this should have gone a lot further than it did. But yeah. Span was just better prepared. He landed those big shots. And not only that, he was he was showing the traits of a very good striker. He was doing, like, striking calculus as the, the round was going on. Like it, it, that, that punch you were talking about, the one that came right down the middle, he actually took a shot in exchange for that punch, but he had to kind of weigh out the option. Like, all right, how heavy is that punch going to be? Is it going to set me back too much? And while you're, when you're making that analysis, a lot of that comes from experience because you're just having to read the body movements on the fly. And sometimes you're very wrong and it sucks when you're wrong. <laughs> But the fact that he was making those high level adjustments and his his mind was clearly engaged throughout that whole fight, that's that's what put him over the top here. He was just adjusting as needed, landing the big shots, and then he resisted the temptation of like, oh good, he's down. I'm gonna like get on top of him or do some wrestling stuff. He was like, no, go ahead and stand back up because I was being successful. When we were doing that. Let's keep that jam going. <laughs> so that it just he just did it until he won, and that was awesome. So you know, good job. Um, hopefully this is a lesson for, uh, uh how do I can't even say these fucking names. Kirkinov to, uh, <laughs> go Misha, ahead. Misha Kirkinov. Yeah. Kirkinov. Kirkinov. There you go. Kirkinov. But yeah, no, this is, this should be a lesson. Like, you know, it, it, I <laughs> get you it. Said... You want to take time off, but you got to keep working if you're a professional. What'd you think I said? Cause I mispronounced uh, names all said... the time. I would hate to have the last name Serkinov because it rhymes with jerking off. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jerkinoff. Yikes. Oh, I thought that's what you said. I thought you said jerking off, and I'm like, that's the first time I've ever heard that. See, Whoops. see, I, I knew that I knew this is why John Anik took the week off. <laughs> because he like the way John Anik goes is he he goes into the fight card, he, he goes to every fighter, he's like, Is this how you say your name? He asks them three <laughs> times, then he says it back to them, and then when they say yes, he's like, Okay, because he He's a perfectionist. He doesn't want to say their name wrong. And then I go see the, I, I go watch uh, a majority of this uh, fight card. And I'm like, okay, John X not there. And then I see some of the names on the card. And I'm like, that's why. You know, I was like, mm -hmm. he took that, uh, that sick day, knowing that he's going to have to say Sirkin off uh, <laughs> uh, several times in the fight card or Simmersburg, which was the first fight. And he was like, I'm not having this. I'll, I'll come back next <laughs> week with like Brunson and Holland. I, that that's there easy to say, you know. Shoot, just let yeah. me announce all the names. At least it'll be funny. It'll be up there for like two minutes. Like, uh, Kirk, 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 is that right? Is that even a C? These Russian names sometimes it's like a G or some weird shit. CCP somehow stands for USSR. So I don't know with your crazy language. Really. <laughs> there you go. I got a right before I get into mine. Commentator, commentators kept some bias all night. I did like when they asked Bisbin if he could continue. Bisbin said, "You can't ask me that, as I'll always continue. I'm not a Bisbin guy, but stock went up for me." Mm -hmm. We got a uh, Verrett Cody chiming in. Yes, sir. All right. Okay, so let me let me tell you who that guy is right there. That's that's the one and only Mr. Pablito. Uh, he, Cody Verrett. He is uh, he, he's from Louisiana. He is an MMA fighter. He, he fights in uh, uh, he, he, he fights in one of the lower circuits right now, but he is a training partner of Dustin Poirier's. And oh, nice. He's, he's, he, and he's actually become my friend over these past uh, few months or so, just, just from being on Twitter. And I'm waiting on my t-shirt, Pablito, because I told him <laughs> if he, because Pablito's got his t-shirts right now, uh, so I'm waiting on my T-shirt, but 
Nice, nice. Thanks for chiming in, though, uh, as yeah, one, awesome. one of his friends, uh, which is very cool. I actually went, like, I don't go traveling that much, but uh, two years ago I went to New Orleans, and it was one of the best times I've had uh, yeah. on Bourbon Street. The food New Orleans, is um, – bro. The, the, <laughs> the, food like is, the, 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 food, the food is amazing. Yep. The best. Uh, uh, and then drinking there is nice because everything's cheap because they want mm. they just want you to go to Bourbon Street and then they offer you like the best prices ever. Oh yeah. Uh, but then definitely like I I recommend anybody to go there whenever you can. But we've also got a couple of other comments. He's knocked out before uh, you pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got I'll you, brother. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thanks. But like, like, he has the best. Like I'm, uh, no, you go. Oh, I was just gonna say he has the best mullet in the biz too. <laughs> nice. uh, Follow him nice. on Twitter. I love mullets. I love mullets. As he says, "Don't be a fan later." <laughs> I'll be a fan now. How about that? There you go. There you go. Uh, right. But uh, I was looking at this fight, and then of course this is my stereotype. I'm gonna go with the wrestler to begin with, and then the the numbers steered me in the wrong direction because when you look at the numbers before this, you see uh, uh, Serkinov would average four or five takedowns a, a fight, and then you look at it and it was like, yeah, he averages that much, and then he has so so striking, but he didn't do any of that. Mm. And like Grant, he probably never had the chance to, but and then you look at Span and you know. He can hit hard, but his striking is isn't that that good. It's just he has yeah. power when he does connect. Like his accuracy is bad, but and then he's more of a grappler. That didn't mm. have to get started very really that much because his yeah. apparently his striking was so good that fight that he was able to just do that. And then he knew that Serkinov uh, was very really good on the ground, so he was like, "Yeah, you just come back up. I'm I'm working mm. you. You come back up." more to it because I'm just going to keep on knocking you back down. And then he had that. And then there's a reason why he's called Superman span for a reason. <laughs> and then he showed it. And then I, I'm looking at him right now for who he could face next. He's he, he was ranked number 13 and then Serkinov was number 11. So I can only assume that they're going to swap spots yeah, and he'll be number, sense. he'll be number 11 right now. You got Jimmy Crute, who is going to be fighting Anthony Smith, who is ranked number six. I believe that's yep. what it is. Am, am I correct? Right? Yeah, until they Anthony shift Smith around things. Six. Yep. You had Krylov, who is number nine. He just lost to Ankalev. Yep. And then Odesmir has been uh, – he's been inactive. And then I think yeah. Johnny Walker just got booked. I think he just got booked. And yeah, then you he had – he he recently uh, Span lost to uh, Johnny Walker in his last fight. Okay, so, so you're not gonna see yeah, you're not gonna see that happen. You look below him at 14 and 15. You were supposed to have this week was supposed to be Jamaica Jim, Hall, no Jamaica Hill. Uh, I don't know. I think they put it in wrong. <laughs> hey, when, uh, we do. I think they we do. <laughs> Why is Jamal everybody Hall. gonna have difficult names? Yeah, there you go. Uh, you, you got Hill versus Paul Craig. That was supposed to be this week coming up, but it uh, mm -hmm. uh, Hill got injured, it looked like. Uh, so they had mm -hmm. to scrap so. that, and I think they're going to rebook it. So they're inactive. I could see Span against like a Ozemir or uh, mm -hmm. like a, a Nikita Kryoff because he lost. He's there at nine. Yeah. So I could see that 11 mm -hmm. 9 matchup. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Like, I, don't, I have no idea what they're going to do with Vulcan Ozemir. He's been inact I feel like he's been inactive for so long that he's just sitting there. At give eight. him to Kirkinov because I mean Kirkinov apparently took a bunch of time off, so it's going to yeah. take him a little while to kind of get back in the groove. Maybe give those two yeah. a shot, and then whoever yeah, wins, you know, a, keep them going. Yeah, that that was my my first start. Yeah, but uh, but then I was like, I would like to see him face Krylov more, just yeah. because Krylov, even I though he lost, because even yeah. though he lost, he did well against uh, Magomed. He did well against them. The first, he got the first round, yeah, and then for a while. <laughs> second round. Second round was so so like. Yeah. But then the third round, he just completely lost. Oh yeah. Because of the ground game, but, but uh, I th I think you could book that. I think you could book Span and and Krylov. I think that would be a, like a perfect fight. Two guys that are yeah. the bo yeah, both both trying to be active. You could book that like in a for a month or two from now because it seems like 
all these light heavyweight guys are trying to fight sooner rather than uh, take all that time off which mm-hmm. which uh, which is nice because like like I said in the next two months the whole top 15 will have far from like two weeks ago uh, up until like at the end of April I feel like all the the guys are going to be fighting and the only guy that I think wasn't the only two guys who, that weren't booked or had been booked and then uh, had it rescheduled was to share who fought like two months ago mm. and then uh, uh, Vulcan Olsmere who has been active. So uh, like I, it was an impressive uh, fight for a span. He showed us something that he really didn't show before and mm-hmm. improved. So it makes it good for the booking wise late uh, going down the line, seeing that he was a grappler with a, a nice uh, like uh, hook that now it seems like his striking is getting better. So that adds mm-hmm. to his repertoire and it makes things better moving on. And you're going to see uh, better booking for him. Like you're seeing more on uh, the main card more instead of just like prelims. Like yeah. this was his uh, chance to show himself uh, even more in a, because this was the co-main event. And then he proved himself. So may- maybe he could get like an, a fight night in main event. I mean, or another co-main event, but remains to be seen. But I, I see him fighting in the next two months. I, I just without all the all the fighters are going now, trying to book more fights, especially with the the Venom deal coming up in April, where they're going to be getting paid more because of the yeah. the, the the pay they're going to get with the the merchandise. There, it's just a yeah. more. It, it gives them more pay. It's more it's a better avenue for them than to just wait three, four months and then fight twice a year. Yeah. If they can yeah. fight three, four times a year and then making more on top of what they made now, the, 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 they're going to be sitting pretty. But yeah. uh, he said, how still is them healthcare though? Still, yeah, still them healthcare. No, no, I, I agree <laughs> with that. But he said, how Smith still number six. Like he's been, it's because of who he's fighting. Mm-hmm. He's not just fighting slouches. He's fighting, top tier guys in that division yeah. and then he has lost but then he has won as well so it's just a case of like how far down do you move i guess you can kind of say with jeremy stevens all of jeremy stevens fights have been against uh really good opponents like mm. you're not going to move him out of the top 10 when he loses to two three or four Right. Uh, I think it's like, also the fact that this division isn't as stacked as some of the other ones, yeah. you know? So, like, if there's a decent fighter, you're not like, all right, cut him down to, like, the bottom 15. They're like, no, I mean, we, we were running out of people. That, but they're also trying to bring up guys like Ankalaev and probably now Ryan Spann, uh, Jimmy Crute, try to get them in that top 10 slot to kind of stack that division. But it's not yeah. there yet. So that's probably why it's, he's getting who, more longevity. Who, who Smith lose to? Was it to share where he got that very bad face? Uh, in, in, in the pummel, yeah. like where he took the, all that Dude. damage, and then he, and then yeah. didn't he lose after that to Rackage? Was it Rackage? Uh, mm. Yeah, I believe so. But yeah, I'll take your word for it. He <laughs> for like three rounds, and his teeth fell out. Oof! Yeah, I know that was that was bad. But then Big he, then yikes. he, and then he booked he, the, the fight right away, and then fought two months later, or well, mm, less yeah. than a month, I believe. It, it wasn't that long. But before I go yeah. to the main event, I got a couple of comments on here. He said they both looked huge compared to say Izzy at two hundred. Yeah, yeah, hundred. Then of course, five. Then he said that Walker has a broken chin, can't go far with that. I mean, that's a tough one to recover from. I mean, it depends on how bad the break is, but like, unfortunately, every time your jaw gets unhinged or like some serious damage to like your jawline, it it does affect your your chin in terms of like how much striking resistance to the face that you can take. But I mean, it's a minor injury. It'll be all right. Yeah. Yeah. Just ask uh, what's his name in heavyweight who just got released. Oh, uh, uh, Overeem? Overeem. Overeem. Alistair Overeem. Glass chin. He gets popped. I mean, he used to have a really good chin. I think he just took too many. And then he's like, the body got too damaged and he can't fight like that anymore. Fun fact, though, about Alistair Overeem, he hasn't lost a decision in any organization going back to 2003. I mean, he was good. He was number six in the division as an old timer. Like, that's holding it down, you know? I was highly surprised. 
I know that's a little off subject, but I'm, I, you know, I, I, I understand the JDS let go. But Overeem's mm-hmm. been on a winning streak. He was on his title run, and he just loses and they let him it, go. It was, but, it, was right. you know. it was mutual. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, that, I think I think he knew that legends. he was fading. Yeah, they're both legends. I mean, they they have nothing else to prove to me, especially not yeah. Overeem. Oh, yeah. yeah, we got a daddy uh, saying, lost lots of teeth, Smith. Yeah, he definitely did. <laughs> then we got, I like it, guys. Good discussions. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. No, I meant he just has a weak one. Oh, oh he's talking about the chin. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's what I noticed with a lot of guys. You see him getting popped, and, and then it becomes like a like a, a season thing where you see them getting popped and then falling down. You, you kind of notice who has like a weak chin and who mm-hmm. doesn't like. Like I'm seriously seeing like the Diaz brothers, they take so much damage, but they got great chins because they just seem to get back up. You mm-hmm. know, they just take too much damage, and then somehow they can take it without it dropping. Their jaws are fine, and then you got some fighters that you hit them once, they just fall down like boom, and then Alistair was great, and then he turned into the one of those guys that you hit him once cleanly, he's done. But uh, that's just what happens in the UFC. You you gotta have somebody that wins and somebody that loses, and then this is what Dana White loves. He loves guys getting knocked out, <laughs> and knocked yeah. out because it's good for business. Yeah. And you want to see the fans go ah crazy right. instead of the born. Oh, let me lay on a guy for five rounds. Mm-hmm. And like that, that's not gonna make money because you're gonna have people be bored. And then that, that, that's kind of like what I saw from a comment way before where they were like, I, I remember when the UFC first started and the, when UFC first started, it was all guts, all glory, but I thought it was all a mess. It was all a mess then. Yeah. I, I kind of like it now because they have structure and yeah. they have some structure. They have divisions. You fight in your division. You fight yeah. a guy. They try, and, they, they try and manage it a lot better. And that's why it's a... Yeah. The well, back then, it was it, like a loose concept, right? They yes. were like, "Oh, what, what would happen if we put like a boxer and a judo guy in there? Well, how would that go down?" You know, like, like a over wrestler. time, I think they figured out. Uh, <laughs> you're not gonna stand have by. more. Stand by. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, man. Yeah, you're not gonna have like a wrestler go up against a sumo wrestler. Right. Uh, like, well, they almost had great. that if you remember yeah. in the in the very first UFC. But there was there's an interesting video. Um, you should go check it out. It's from. Uh, Jesse M. Camp, but it's not even his video. He's interviewing uh, Superfoot Wallace, who was one of the commentators at the very first UFC. And he was saying like, oh no, this was 100% like a marketing stunt for Brazilian mm-hmm. Jiu-Jitsu because of the way they did the matchups, the like how they called out, I think it was the sumo wrestler guy, that huge dude. And then they were like, oh no, TKO. And the guy's like, what are you talking about? I'm fine. Like, Let's keep fighting. But they he, wanted him out early before he a, got to one of the Jiu-Jitsu and, guys. And, and then I was telling my uh, my he's the story about that because he he's an actor and he's mm-hmm. in one of my favorite shows hawaii 50 mm-hmm. and, and then i'm looking at him like like i'm watching this show like just for like years and i'm like this guy looks familiar where do i know him from <laughs> and that's what right. it was he was in the very first uh, uh ultimate fighter because he was the sumo wrestler mm-hmm. that they had on there and he looked, looked just the same just like 20 20 years or so later right and mm-hmm. like back then just like that the they just wanted to put guys in seats. It was not managed great. That's why they wind up going uh, bankrupt because people didn't want to show that on TV. And then that's right. why you heard the whole big story of Dana White and how long it took him to get rights. Like he would camp out at TV stations. And then when he bought the UFC, he bought it for just, the only thing that he had was this sign that said UFC on it. <laughs> and, and when he bought it, and then that's right. when he got the Ferretta brothers involved and mm-hmm. then they started putting money into it and they started doing like, like a structure and right. to, yeah. get, to get everything. And then it slowly built and built and built to this massive empire per se. And right. that uh, they went all the way from barely getting on pay-per-views to now being aligned with ESPN, oh, yeah. which is this huge thing. When you think of uh, mixed martial arts and uh, MMA, that's mm-hmm. what, like, like that's huge. All because of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. I feel you on that. Yep. But uh, w- let's get going into. Uh, well, actually, we got a couple comments. So I got a good one. Hey, guys, what are your thoughts on Cowboy versus Sanchez fight? 
Did that uh, already happen? Because I no, it's coming it. up. It's, it's coming, coming up. up okay. <laughs> May, it's coming up May first. It's uh, one of Cowboy Cerrone's last fights. I think he oh, has one or two yeah. fights left on his. Uh, uh, he, he said he's going to fight one or two times, and this is one of them. I feel mm-hmm. good for Cowboy here because usually one of his downfalls is he fights too often, and then he also has glass chin. But this is an intriguing matchup where I think. If with the time off that he's taken, he's going to put a lot of effort into it, knowing that he's going to retire. And then he wants to keep his sponsors after he retires because he just gained a bunch of sponsors in the past year, which is why he's like, which is why he's not fighting as much. I think he's he's going to want to put into uh, like a a good performance in, and he's one of those guys that when he's fighting somebody below him, he always wins. When he fights somebody ahead of him. That's when he kind of struggles or is 50-50. And this is a classic uh, matchup where I think he, he'll pull out. I think he'll actually get the knockout in the in this fight. It depends on uh, if it's a main event or a, co- a co-main event because it's going to be high up there. But I could mm. see him picking up a knockout just with uh, how he tends to fight against guys that he's supposed to be. All right, all right. I'd have to do research. I don't know off yeah. the top of my head. <laughs> yeah. It was a good hot mess back in the old days. Of the UFC loved those days. Yep. <laughs> Cowboy is my boy, my favorite MMA fighter. I always pick him. I am loyal. Hey, yeah. I, I like him That's too. Good. Is he? He's the guy that started the let me fight five times a year, but he did it because he spends so much money. He needs to support his lifestyle. Right. And he he he's the first to admit that too. And he said, "I agree with you." But uh, now that that's done, uh, let's get with the, the main event that we have, which only lasted uh, uh, not that long. Was the yeah. main event, which was a yeah, which was a welterweight matchup between Leon Edwards and Belir Muhammad, where they fought to a no contest. Yeah. Uh, I'll start with you, uh, Miles. Man. <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but like for some reason, all the most exciting fights just like some shit happens and it's either a DQ or a no contest. Same thing with the Aljamain Sterling and Yon fight. That was probably one of the more exciting fights of the night. And that freaking knee got in there and then they stopped it. And I was like, damn it, I wanted to see that go into the championship route. That would have been awesome. But I don't know. I felt like this was also one of those fights where like, you know, Muhammad was coming out pretty good when he started that first round. And then Leon Edwards was, you know, kind of feeling him out, finding his range. And then once he got more comfortable with like, all right, I think I have a pretty decent idea of how this guy's working. He got more confident. He started letting the hands go, letting those kicks go. And we saw like a really awesome back and forth, a really good exchange. And and then like <laughs> just an eye poke. But like that was a really bad eye poke. Like, holy shit, that one was bad. Like you know it's bad when he's on the floor screaming and he's yeah. like, I can't see anything out of that eye. So like, hopefully he doesn't go blind and this is like a career ending thing. But I think Michael Bisbing brought up a good point. Like maybe there's like something here that we need to visit with the eye pokes because eye pokes have been happening a lot recently. It happened in the in the Curtis Blades and the Lewis fight. There was like, <laughs> they had to stop a couple times for the eye pokes. Um, I feel like I've been seeing eye pokes more often rather than, you know, back in the day, it was like every once in a while you get like the stray eye poke or like an illegal knee. Uh, I don't know what's going on, but maybe like they need to talk about wrapping the fingers, you know, kind of like in the, in the gauze wrap uh, before they go out there to at least like keep them together. And so like, even if it gets to your face, you know, it's, you know, it's not like you're going to get a single finger going in the eye and shit. Uh, he talked about different gloves. I don't know if I agree with the gloves thing because then it would like, it definitely stunts your ability to do grappling. Uh, even if you do those, um, I don't know if you've seen them before, like the uh, discount, you know, discount market sentry gloves where it's like there's padding kind of all around the hand and then in the middle at the bottom where your palms are, there's like nothing there and it just kind of loops around your the middle of your fingers. Uh, so it, it's not a total covering of the hand. But even then, it's not a great glove, and it's hard to, like, manipulate things. So if they keep changing up the gloves too much, then I think it's going to affect the ability for people to grapple. And that's the, the the benefit with the gloves they have now is that you can do, like, various wrestling and grappling things without too much, uh, you know, too many things impeding you. 
but I would, I would, I would be fine with them like wrapping the fingers together, like so they have mitten hands, because you can still do every jujitsu grip that you need to do. You can do every wrestling grip you need to do if your hands are like mitten wrapped, um, and then you have like the glove ending uh, right where the knuckles are to make sure everything, the padding's in the right place. But I mean, we gotta, we gotta figure this out. <laughs> this is really bad. I wanted to see this fight go forward. I personally thought Edwards was really building up some steam and he was going to pull out the win here. Um, unless Muhammad, you know, went into, you know, the rest of the second round and into the third round with some game changes thinking about like, all right, you know, he's getting those shots in and they're, they're taking their toll. You could tell he was getting, he was getting wobbled before the eye poke. So he was having to, to just fight to survive a little bit. But I think if, you know, he really deserved to be in that top three spot, that would be the point at which he would start to go. All right. I need to change up my strategy. Here's what I'm going to do now. You know, that sort of thing. But uh, unfortunately, we didn't even get that far. So that was yep. big disappoint. Big disappoint. Let me go to your uh, opinion of this, Jay, before I got some big announcement. Listen, I'll just say, I mean, it was heartbreaking. You know, it, Leon Edwards didn't have to take this fight. Leon, Leon deserved an opponent much higher ranked. So... Even though there was the bad blood in the, you know, with what Leon said in their stare down, which totally pissed me off. But I respect Leon for taking this fight. Because if there's any any opponent good, good enough to face Leon, it's Bilal. You know, and Bilal, I like the guy so much. You know, not not, not just as a fighter, but as a person too. Um, he's a personality in his own. And I really love the guy. But... You know, this fight was. It, I, I know it's going to be known for the eye poke, but it shouldn't be remembered as that because we talked about ring rust earlier uh, with Misha Serkinov, which clearly looked like was something that he was dealing with. So it made us think, how's Leon going to look? Leon looked better, in, in my honest opinion. Everything was crisp, his movement. He looked amazing in that first round. I mean, Bilal did what he could, but Leon was about to take over that fight. There's no question about it. There's no question about it that Leon was about to take over that fight. So for this to happen, it it, it is it, it is heartbreaking. Do I think they should make the rematch? Probably not, uh, because like I said, this was Bilal stepping up to face Leon. Um, do I think that Leon deserves? Uh, a title shot? Absolutely. I mean, the guy deserved a title shot anyway. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's an unfortunate situation, uh, you know, with Bilal and, and the eye poke, but these things happen. You know, we can talk about coming up with different kinds of gloves that they can wear. I don't think there's anything they can do. I honestly don't think that there's anything that they can do. Even if they wrap their fingers up, it, you know, oh in mitten style, they're going to find a way to get into their eyeballs. Mm -hmm. You know, so like I said, I'm, I, I'm heartbroken for Bilal, but even though the eye poke happened, I'm still happy for Leon because I think he's still going to get his title shot. You know, I, I'm not a fan of the guy. I'll tell you, I'm not a fan of Leon, but is he deserving of a title shot? Absolutely. So, and, let me apologize. I'm having some technical difficulties over here. <laughs> I, didn't expect it, I, I didn't expect that my phone, because I, I, I got here after work, and uh, I didn't expect that my phone was so low on battery. So I'm kind of uh, – I'm winging it right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're winging it every night. So yeah, it's, all right. it's cool. But, <laughs> you know, like it. goes. But, Flying by but, the seat of our pants. But – I mean, I hope it's not a career-threatening injury, but because once, as soon as that finger hit the eyeball, I think that's probably the worst eye poke I've ever seen as far as pain mm. is concerned. I mean, Bilal was in tears immediately, you know, yeah. and it just makes you think and pray that it's not, you know, it, it, it's not a life-threatening thing that right. is going to affect him for the rest of his career. And I hope that's not the case because I love Bilal. I want to see him fight in the UFC. Uh, everybody wins when he fights in the UFC. So I pray that, uh, you know, he's okay. I hope this isn't a career threatening injury like Michael Bisbing, you have to lose your eyeball. Um, but, um, but either way, 
Leon still looked amazing. And I, 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 I there's no, no other, no other way to put it. He deserves a title shot. Give, give the guys title shot. And I don't know about that. Like I, I do. I, I from what I heard, Muhammad's eye is going to be fine. Like it That's sucks. Good. It sucks that it was the thumb that caught him in the eye. It wasn't like it was yeah. a finger. He got caught like in the thumb, like this. Yikes. And, and from what this doctor said, that like, he should be fine. Just a few weeks of uh, recover and letting it heal or whatnot. Like he probably won't be fighting for like uh, uh, maybe two months. But um, I, I could, see, but like I do see like your point on Edwards. Like he did have a strong first round where he caught him a couple of times. He had him wobbly, but then I felt like Muhammad recovered. And then the second round, he caught him a little bit, but then Muhammad caught him with that really good uppercut that stunned uh, Edwards for a few seconds. And then they they were going back and forth until the eye poke where. Mm. He caught him with the eye poke, and then he did get him with the kick, but they, he was already compromised with the eye poke, so he wasn't really defending it. I felt like Muhammad was it was going to start getting going, and then he was going to transition into the wrestling probably by round three. Uh, and I, I, I don't think he was planning on going to that until later on uh, because that, that, that would favor him just using that conserve his energy because I felt like he was going to have an easier chance uh, in the later rounds with how much uh, Edwards was working in the first two rounds to get the takedowns. But it is what it is. Uh, like they fought to a new contest. Edwards looked pretty decent early, but I don't think it warrants a title fight. He's been, like I said, he's been inactive for two two years, and then you have a fight, and then it ends in the second round. Or mm-hmm. the, uh, the cap rated through the second round by eye poke. I don't think that warrants a... A, a title shot right away it could but then it kind of mm. transitioned into the big news that i just received uh, that on uh right here mm-hmm. that we're gonna have mass for all uzman uh, two on april Very 24th much. it's gonna headline the the ufc 262 uh, 261 which is now gonna have three title fights Oh wow! Another three, three fights. Yeah. It's going to be this one, and then the co-main event, and then the third fight will be the women's uh, title fights. That's what I thought. Wasn't isn't Shevanko fighting in that one? If yep. I'm not mistaken, yeah. So okay. wait, it, wait. Card. So I'm just now hearing this. Is this UFC 261? Yes. Yes. Because did, April. Is, is, I, yeah. We're going to have two, I, I just, We're going to have 260 I, next week, and then it's going to be three weeks. Worth oh, of uh, uh, fight Damn. mates. <laughs> well, actually, okay. no. the The first week of April is going to be UFC on ABC. Then they're going to have two weeks of uh, fight nights, and then this is going to be the the end of April. And they're going to have this at a full capacity crowd in Jacksonville, Jacksonville. Florida, well, at the see, Memorial. I saw that. I saw yeah. that part. I, I just didn't see that it was Masvidal and Usman until it's now. Masvidal, That's Usman, the reason it's, I'm like. <laughs> Masvidal Usman too. They 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 just announced it in the last hour or so. Mm, interesting. Uh, wow. Interesting. Which which I would have liked to see them as coaches though. And mm. then I'm gonna I'm gonna like to hear his excuses of oh I, all I had was a month to prepare. <laughs> <laughs> it's Jeez. better than six days, but you know right. he has no excuse now uh, with this fight. Yeah. Like, Absolutely. Uh, I mean, just I don't know why they don't give Stephen Thompson a shot at it. He's the only one who hasn't, you know, taken a shot and hasn't been beat yet. So I mean, why not just well, give, think, it a, give it? Well, a he, shot? Didn't it he, did, he, he didn't have it. He didn't have a shot at Usman, but he had two title shots against Woodley, and he had mm-hmm. a draw and a loss. That's mm-hmm. probably why. I mean, I yeah, but, but Usman's not Woodley, right? It's a different guy now. Oh yeah, so, it's I mean, a different guy. But it'd be interesting if, to see. I, if if you're gonna give Thompson uh, the fight. Uh, well, I shouldn't say Thompson. If you're going to give, I still don't get this with how you're going to give Masvidal a rematch, but then you got Colby Covington, who is ranked number one right now, and he has to wait. <laughs> he literally had to fight Willie. He dominated Willie back in October mm-hmm. and won that fight. Yet you had Masvidal, who took this one on six days' news, which I get. And I get why, because he only had six days, but he lost this and he hasn't mm-hmm. fought six. Since it's been mm-hmm. almost eight months and he hasn't fought, and you're going to give him a, a, a immediate re- rematch without yeah, ha- him having to work that. for a rematch. 
Uh, that doesn't make sense for me. Probably money. Well, it's a, money yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's so 1.3 million pay-per-views. You yeah. know? So they're money. just trying to go off that. I mean, they well, don't want it to go. It's sold that before. It's so it's sold that before he was even put into this because there's him and Burns. They were selling stuff mm-hmm. with that uh, beforehand, and then uh, they don't get all those things just within six days. The, the, you, you had people that are buying it beforehand. I, I think I think Mass is uh, hugely overrated in the aspect of he hasn't put uh, put off all these big win streaks. And like he's put off like a two fight win streak, and then he just shoots up the the rankings, or th- three fights. And like it hasn't been anything big, and then he goes, and, uh, and it's like I know it's like what have you done for me lately? But it's like you just lost five round fight, all five rounds to the champion. Where yeah. like I said, Covington mm-hmm. was beating Usman four rounds, to, uh, three three rounds to one, <coughs> and then uh, just got. Uh, popped in the end because he had his jaw was basically uh, out. Like he, oh, yeah. got his, he got his jaw knocked out and then he continued to fight and lead the fight for the rest of the fight and then just got hit in the right spot and then the, the fight called him and then there was also uh, uh, stuff in that fight with the the crazy stoppage getting hit in the groin when he didn't get hit in the groin and then uh, they gave Usman like two minutes to recover from that, which killed Covington's momentum. I think mm-hmm. that's something that sells a fight there. All that happening, then you had Covington win, and then him talking shit right afterwards to Usman, saying, hey, I'm taking you serious now. I'm not going to jerk around now, like, uh, and everything. And he hasn't fought since. Like, and now mm-hmm. I have a feeling it's going to be Covington against Burns. I think they're mm-hmm. really going to do that. Yeah, that might be good because I think what they're probably doing is evaluating based on money because they're out of dudes to fight Usman other than Thompson. And I think there's going to be a delay before they can get guys like yeah. uh, Neil Magny, Luke, uh, Muhammad, if he can return to get up into those top five spots because it looks like they're trying to kind of shift numbers around to guys who are more exciting, guys who draw crowds, guys who are, you know, more active in, in fighting and trying to phase out people who, yeah. you know, you're just kind of sitting in, in ranking spots, not really doing anything with it. So they're probably just looking at raw money numbers. Like that's probably the decision here is, well, you know, of the uh, top five guys that we could put, who made the first, who made the most money the first time around? We'll do that again. Yeah. You know? Well, I think, well, I think Covington I- and uh, Covington and Usman made more money than Masvidal and Usman. Uh-huh. Back in December, because that was a, I think that made more well, how's money. How's Covington recovering though? Because I mean, you don't get your jaw that fucked up, and you're just but, ready to go again. You know what I mean? There's well, no, even wait. if he says he is, there's going to be recovery time well, at that. Well, he well, fought. He, said, he, he fought afterwards. He fought afterwards. Yeah, he fought, he fought Woodley, Woodley, and he dominated oh, he did? that. Yeah, he he stopped yeah, that, him in the was, fourth he, round, I believe. Yeah, people, oh, wow. people. It was actually in uh, December of 2019, and yeah, that was probably one of the best fights of the year, and you know. Although Masvidal, you know, he I don't even think he was deserving of his title shot that he got in last last July, but I was happy for him. I was happy mm-hmm. for him to see someone who yeah. has been in the UFC so long to finally get a title shot. It's kind of like Bisping, uh, you know, like one of those guys. So, yeah, I was happy for Masvidal. And, you know, they sold 1.3 million pay-per-views. And... It, from what I from what I saw, based on the traffic, like on YouTube and everything like that, what it was pre Burns, and then when Masvidal came in, those 1.3 million pay per view buys were because of Masvidal, you know, mm-hmm. and that's why Usman wants this fight because he got a nice payday and he doesn't want time oh, yeah. to just slip by where he can't capitalize on another big payday. Now, like Miles said, you know, I want to see Wonder Boy. Is it time for that? I, not right now, but I honestly think Wonder Boy poses the biggest problem to Usman than anybody because, you know, the good thing about Usman is, is he, he if he can't strike with you, he's going to get his hands on you. Mm-hmm. And I, in Wonder Boy, in, in, in his last three fights, he has looked phenomenal. Like, he, he, he won't let anybody get close to him. So I think Wonder Boy poses the biggest threat to Usman's title right now. Um, but... I would have liked to see them actually be tough coaches instead of pushing this out so fast. So now I don't know who we're going to have as tough coaches because I think these two guys were the biggest candidates um, 
to be tough coaches. So for them to rush this, it, I, I, I question it. You know what I mean? I understand mm-hmm. that it's going to be in Jacksonville and, you know, we have our first full crowd. I just, I, I don't know. I, I think I, that's I, maybe, I think that's maybe why they went mass for all because he's from Miami. So it's in Florida, yeah. his mm. home state. Maybe they went that route. Like, Oh, he's from there. Maybe he'll be able to put seats in, get people to go that hour yeah. to up North right. to, from Miami to uh, Jacksonville. And then, uh, and then the, the fact Masvidal that, thing. Uh, well, Masvidal's thing, you know, it, 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 he, it, he took that fight because he had a fallback. He had a fallback, you know, hey, I, I took this on a week's notice. And after yeah, I was he lost, bring that up. his whole idea was, let's see what I can do with a full fight camp. I guarantee mm-hmm. you he's not in fight camp right now. And he's <laughs> going to fight in late April. And then next thing you know, we're going to have another excuse that says, oh, I only had a month to prepare. What if I would have he drank wine. <laughs> yeah. He drank wine the like night that. before. So <laughs> it, it, I, I love how, how big this pay-per-view is now, but I can't I, I, I can't feel satisfied, uh, you know, with this. I would have been okay with the two women's fights because I still think that that card yes. with the two women's fights is going to be one of the best cards of the year. Yeah, like I, I think I think after seeing this, I think it's a lock that Covington is going to be one of those tough enough, uh, uh, not tough enough, uh, tough uh, ultimate fighter. Yeah, tough coaches. Mm-hmm. Because of not just his pedigree, but because of his mouthpiece, he's gonna yeah, he's gonna yeah. talk he's gonna yeah. talk shit. He, <laughs> he's, gonna, he's gonna get people tuned oh, in just to see what he has to say and shit talk to the other guys. But then, I, not I'm even just, just to the other guys. What about to the people on his team? Like <laughs> every yeah, time uh, I hear people talk about Covington, they're like, "We don't like Covington. He's got a terrible personality." Well, so look, I always got his own team. The, well, look uh, at look. Look at one uh, the, the people that have said it. Yeah. Uh, and one of them is Masvidal. Yeah, He's Masvidal the, was talking shit. It, yeah. it was Masvidal. Masvidal is known for talking shit. So, yeah. and then well, the other Askren person said the same thing too. Ben Who? Askren said the same. Ben Askren said the same yeah. thing. He's like within the wrestling community, like we there's these little pods and everybody kind of knows each other. Nobody yeah. likes Covington in the wrestling uh, community apparently. So. Well, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. It'll be an interesting I, I, season. But, but that, <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't that be perfect for right. selling money? <laughs> right, a guy yeah. that no one likes. It, yeah. And then somebody it made the perfect point to me. They were like, it, it was a funny thing. They were like, I love this Colby Covington thing where he backs the president. What if he just goes in oh, now gosh. and decides that he wants to back uh, Joe Biden now? <laughs> and then he just <laughs> and then he just keeps on like every time they they oh, be swear in a new president. Right. That's who, that's his guy then. He keeps that bringing his interim belt to the White House. <laughs> and that would be his, his WWE uh, stick. He just follows yeah. all the presidents. Yes. Hey, what's <laughs> up? Matter. Hey, what's up? That's my uh, boy Joey right there. Joey Biden. <laughs> Joey oh, Biden. God. And, but if, oh. you, if you look at him, he went from a nobody to like this big guy within a span of like six months. Right. Not even. Yeah. Like right away. Just because he like... Like everybody knows, it's not like that's not him. It's just this facade that he's put up to make money, and then mm-hmm. he just rolls with it, kind of like the Undertaker rolled rolled with the the Undertaker thing for all those years in the in wrestling because it mm-hmm. makes money, and you you just live by it. And he he's just so invested in it that he's like, as long as this makes me money, I don't care. Uh, you yeah. know, he has this close circle, and that's it. That's why I want to see how he does being a coach there because he he is very smart and and i think he can pass off a lot of knowledge to these to these up-and-comers coming into the into the tough house on on this season and Mm -hmm. he'd be perfect for it and and i have a feeling i don't think burns would do it i I have a feeling it might be like a covington and michael chiesa i think Mm -hmm. for some reason i have a feeling it's going to be that because uh, Michael uh, uh, Chiesa was on, and he won the one season he was on, I believe it was. So for him, for them to have a former winner to come back on it and to coach it, I think that that will that'll get people tuned in. And then on the other side, you have Covington, who Chiesa called out on mm-hmm. his last fight. He called him out just because he knew it would be perfect to make money. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I have a feeling it's going to be that. Interesting. And then uh, before we get going, we have another uh, uh, fight announcement. It was announced today. It's not official yet. They're working on the contracts for it, but 
They're working on a, a lightweight matchup between Michael Chandler and Justin Gage. Mm. Yeah, with Justin Gagey, <sighs> which would, would be a, a bond stormer of a matchup. And I want to hear what you guys think about that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that sounds cool. Well, uh, here, you... <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, I'll, I'll say what, what Miles said. Yeah, yeah that sounds, sounds cool. Yeah, I'm that, that, that... <laughs> fucking pumped. Yeah, like... <laughs> I, I already had my list of most anticipated fights to watch this year, and this one just skyrocketed to the top, without a doubt. I mean, Justin Gaethje and Michael Chandler is the best fight that you can make in the lightweight division right now, as far as entertainment pur- purposes. Not mm-hmm. no no belts, anything like that. I think it's the perfect time to put these two guys together. Uh, it, it's a funny situation because I know uh, me and Debate were talking about prior how. Usman came up to Colorado and Michael Chandler went down to Florida. Is that right? Is that what we're saying? Hey, well, he's no, been no, there. no. Yeah. He's been there since Usman was there. Hmm. And he's still there. Uh, he, he trained, he was training with Usman and uh, Burns, and then Usman went. Hmm. He was primarily yeah, okay, training yeah. with Usman first. And then well, Usman so. went to Colorado, and now he's training with Gagey. And then. Yeah. And then now Chandler primarily trains with Burns. Yeah, and so and, and so when you know when Gaethje and Khabib was announced, it was the story we're finally going to get to see Justin Gaethje's wrestling. We didn't get to see it. No, we didn't. So now, <laughs> so now, now he he's going to go up against Michael Chandler. And like I said, I can watch Kamaru Usman, Michael Chandler roll on a mat for twenty minutes. Maybe not more than 20 minutes, but I'll watch it for about 20 minutes because they are so good, you mm-hmm. know. And Justin Gaethje, uh, you know, we haven't had a chance to see his wrestling. We're going to see his wrestling. Unless mm-hmm. someone gets KO'd in the first round, we're going to have to see his wrestling. Because I know Michael Chandler, I mean, he's going to want to stand with him. But I, 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 Michael Chandler, to me, is one of the best wrestlers in lightweight history. Bellator, I mean, he's not the best. But one of the best, and I know for a fact that he's gonna he he's gonna give us that opportunity for us to see Justin Gaethje wrestle. I want to see Justin mm-hmm. Gaethje wrestle because I've never watched any of his college or anything like that. I wanted to see it, uh, you know, in the octagon. And I know for a fact with this fight and this fight, I mean, there's so many variables. I, I mean, I'm just gonna keep it short. There's so many variables that I could probably talk about for for an hour when it comes to Michael Chandler and Justin Gaethje. I am fucking excited. I am so mm-hmm. fucking pumped for this fight. Yeah, that's it. I'm pumped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, trust me, I am pumped for this fight too, just for the mere fact that the, just like uh, Gaethje, we didn't see uh, Chandler uh, wrestling in his fight uh, uh, was a couple months ago because he didn't yeah. need to use it. Like, right. it, like he popped him with that n- nice shot and got him going on, on the standing up. But I think the big thing that you saw that was a plus from Chandler was his movement, the way he controlled the fight. He controlled the middle, his fast pace. He's a guy that, that can go all five rounds mm-hmm. uh, with, yeah. with how he, his movement is. And then he has that uh, uh, striking that he showed there that, he had people down in him like, oh, I don't know if he can strike stand with guys. He has to use his wrestling. Well, look at right there with uh, with Hooker. Mm-hmm. Here's a guy that took uh, Poirier all five rounds, and that was like a fight of the year candidate, yeah. and he finished Hooker in two and a half minutes. And Justin Gaethje's gonna Justin Gaethje's gonna light them legs up though. You know it. So <laughs> he, that's don't, the, that's, the only that's thing with probably, that is he's slow. He's not fast, and I think. Uh, that will be something that he has to work on. I don't know if I would say slow. He, 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 He's he just not as technical. Up. No, he throws them in, in like his combos. Like he throws I don't mean, one, I don't two, mean and striking. A, I mean moving. Ah. Right. But Justin Gaethje, I mean, his leg kicks, they, they, they kind of come from out of nowhere because they're mm-hmm. in the middle of his punch combinations. And he's throwing like this inside leg kick that just kind of comes out of nowhere. I mean, I, I, I know that people really haven't, uh, talked about the calf kick until Dustin Poirier, you know, did it to Conor McGregor. That's the thing about Justin Gaethje. He doesn't just do leg kicks. He does that calf kick better than anybody. So I'm mm-hmm. interested to see, uh, you know, uh, what Michael Chandler can do. Because, like, uh, you know, in that well, he trains with the, he trains with uh, Gilbert Burns, who does the same thing. 
and yeah. and then he works with them all the time. Well, you and then he used Dan to. No, go ahead. Yeah, I said so. You saw him, uh, uh, like you've seen videos of them two training where you see Gilbert hitting him with those leg kicks and him checking them. Like he's no mm -hmm. slouch against those. No. Uh, he 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 defends them pretty well. Yeah. If you watch all the videos uh, of Chandler and Belter, and then yeah. in the one fight with uh, against Hooker. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. like you said, there's uh, there's so many variables that you can go into. I, I I'm just gonna keep it that I'm excited. I'm. Stoked. Oh yeah, I uh, think it's gonna be. I think it has the the makings of a, a one of the best fights of the year, depending on when they book it. I have a feeling it's gonna be in May. I have a feeling it's gonna be in May. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. they're, they're building up. They just finished building April up with this Masvidal Usman, and then I have a feeling they're gonna start working on May now and get these fights think, going. I think they're going to put it on the. They're they're going to do Dustin Poirier and Connor three. I think they're going to put that as the co-main. Well, I I I I, I was going to say I have a feeling this sets that up. I have a feeling I was like, okay, mm. I see this. Now I can see what they're going to do with Poirier. I think that sets it up unless they throw us like a our left field and go. Oh yeah. nope, we're doing Poirier Oliver, which mm -hmm. I don't see. But then at the same time, you. With all these so announcements questions. they're making, you never right. know. But I have a right. feeling they're going to do McGregor, uh, Poirier three. But I've heard they're not going to do that until like June. Yeah, because I heard uh, Ariel Hawani uh, uh, and Chael Sonnen talking la uh, last week. I think it was on the uh, Ariel, and, Ariel, and, Ariel and the bad guy uh, saying that they two sixty two doesn't have a main event, and I think that's hmm. in May, early summer. So mm -hmm. that maybe the UFC was looking at doing Dustin Poirier and Conor McGregor three, and I, you know, there's no other. Usually May's other... like a yeah. Usually May's like a fight night month where they pump out fight nights, and then at the end of the month for like Memorial Day, that's when they bring in summer with like a good uh, pay per view, which usually is like a heavyweight one, but then it, well, something of that magnitude if they get well, they McGregor on there. Yeah, they, but, well, they were talking because if they can get McGregor in May, and if he can get out of there and get a win, they can pull him mm -hmm. back in July for International mm -hmm. Fight Week. So, you know, so many questions. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. But do you guys, before we get going, do you guys have anything to say? Um, not too much. Just uh, you know, well, keep checking out my stuff, and I do Twitch streams and stuff like that. So it's a lot of fun. <laughs> same here. I, I, for me, uh, thank you guys so much for giving me an opportunity to be on your show. You know, I yeah. I, I, I was on a podcast uh, a few days ago, and that was my first opportunity. And uh, you know, I, I'm just trying to seize these opportunities where I get to do what I love, and that's talk about MMA. So I appreciate nice. you guys so much for having me on here. And you know, anytime in the future, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Yeah, and I, I, as you saying that, I, I'm going to have you on in the next couple of days to do uh, the preview of UFC Vegas 22, which is Derek Brunson versus. Uh, Kevin Holland, which is uh, going to be a sneaky good ma main event matchup. Um, look, at, we got call. a guy in yeah, we got a guy in Holland who uh, has moved up the rankings very quickly because yeah. he's fought four times in the past year, and he's won them. He, he, he oh five, that's even better. No, it, it, no, yeah, he, he, he it was, it, it was five or six. I came no, but six. I think I think. I think he's five, and then I think Figueredo was six. Hmm. I know they were the top two in wins in the past year, year and a half, uh, yeah. uh, because they fought the most. I know before that, before this year, it was uh, Zhang Weili. She had fought five times in in a six month span, and, hmm. and but then she had, since the the fight last February with Joanna, she's been off. Until yeah. next month, which is, I'm excited to see her. That was pretty good, yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna have you on uh, in the next couple of days, and then next week uh, we will be recapping the fight card. Plus, uh, uh, Sam just told me that we're gonna have Carlos Condit on the show next week. That's amazing for like a 20 minute interview right before we do the recap. So tune in next uh, Monday at 8:30. 
as we'll be talking to Carlos Condorant and then uh, and then recapping UFC Vegas uh, 22. Nope. <laughs> yeah, which is which is great. And then I know he's working on a couple of other people uh, as well. Uh, we're trying to build this up, get get more content out, and get some more interviews out uh, like we have been. But thanks to everybody in the comment section for commenting today. That was really nice. Thank you, Jay, for coming on. And as always, thank my co-host, Miles, for joining me once again. Tune in to his stuff, like he said, the Last and Rec podcast. You can find him on Twitter at Last Rec, L-A-U-G-H-S-R-E-C. You can find him on there. You can also find him on Twitch. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it the same uh, Twitter? I'm at Twitch handle. As uh, actually, I just changed it a little while ago. It's uh, laughs and rec pod, and you actually write out and um, just because my handle was way too long. So I was like, oh, shit, gotta, <laughs> yep. gotta shorten that up. But uh, no, I'll be going live uh, tomorrow and Wednesday and then again Sunday. That's my, my content stuff on Twitter or on Twitch rather way more consistent than my audio yeah. stuff right now because I'm going through classes and I'm trying to get all my certifications to be a teacher and stuff. So it takes a, it takes a quite a bit of my day, but uh, yeah, shot. if you want to, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to be a middle school teacher. I don't know about big yeah. shot, but, <laughs> but no, if you want to check me out, I'll be on. Oh, yeah. um, well, actually this week, kind of a, a neat little tie-in. Uh, my Wednesday deep dive topic is going to be Mick martial arts bullshit where I find all of these like bad self-defense and like, you know, Oh, do this and it'll save you from a dangerous situation. Guru guys. And I make fun of them for about, you know, three hours. So yeah. if you want to pop in on that, that's going to be a lot of fun. And then, uh, yeah, Tuesday chill wheel stream, a lot, of, a lot of good stuff coming up this week. Nice. Yep. But as always, we are the cage by IQ. Uh, like I said before, in the beginning, you can follow us on Twitter at Cage IQ on Facebook at Cage My IQ SB and on Instagram at Cage My IQ. And then you can also follow us on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Cage My IQ. And then we're affiliated with uh, the sports box where it, you can bring all your questions and comments and then everybody will get back to you in a nice sports uh, group where we have over 20 podcasts uh, on it, including another MMA podcast, The Fighting Words, which we did uh, a combo right. podcast with last week, yeah. which was great. Yeah, which, cool dudes. Cool dudes. Yep. We, we got to uh, go back on that uh, hoagie bet. We got to make a new one for next <laughs> month. We, yeah, we got to do one for uh, next month's yeah. uh, UFC card. Yep. But you can follow uh, the sports box on Facebook at Sports Box Show. You can follow them on Twitter at Sports Box Show. And then on Instagram at The Sports Box Show. And then you can subscribe on YouTube to The Sports Box. And then just follow all the different uh, podcasts that we on there. But uh, as always, I am your host, D-Bake. I got Miles and then Jay. Everybody have a nice night. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of Cage My IQ on the Sports Box. Please remember to follow us on all of our social media outlets on Facebook at Sports Box Show, Twitter at Sports Box Show, Instagram at The Sports Box Show. Find us on YouTube and join Outside the Box, our Facebook sports discussion group. The Sports Box is brought to you by our sponsor, Showcase Sports in Hamilton. Showcase Sports for the elite athlete and also our friends over at crowdplay download the free crowdplay app today and use promo code the box at sign up for 10 free points thank you for joining us